Good morning. Well, what a beautiful weekend, isn't it? Man, spring is here at least for today. So enjoy it before winter comes back for one last hit sometime. So we're glad you're with us and glad you're with us online as well. I want to thank you, all you who were part of the weekend last weekend, uh, celebrating 41 years of our family's ministry here at CLC. It was a very special time. And uh, this weekend, uh, the Jordan, uh, Jordan Hansen and his family were going to be here, but they had to move that a week. So next week, Pastor Jordan will speak. Uh, so this weekend, it is extra innings on Picture This. So, um, yeah, good news, bad news. And uh, the drawings that you have now, you will have to add to your book because they are not in the book, all right? Uh, but they're very familiar and uh, very bedrock for us both individually uh, and as a church. But before we get there, um, one last shot at my humor. <laughs> yeah, some of you said, any more dad jokes? I'm not sure these are dad jokes. These are just things I thought were funny this week. And so I search for them just for you. Depending on your age, you will or won't get them. Uh, but that's okay, too. You can always Google and figure it out. Uh, but the first one, remember the 20 extra years you added to your life through clean, healthy living? Well, these are them. <laughs> yeah, it kind of makes you wonder, you know, approach avoidance there. Uh, the next one, a wise man once told his wife nothing because he was a wise man. <laughs> so I did run these by the tech team yesterday. They all approved and laughed. So uh, This one you got to be old enough to get. Cause of death, patient laid down the boogie and played that funky music till he died. <laughs> How many of you get that one? All right, baby boomers. Okay, uh, <laughs> ask an older person. Uh, next one. Humans are 90% water, basically cucumbers with anxiety. So <laughs> what we share in common. And then uh, this reminds me of our dog and those dachshunds I told you about. How my dog sees himself when the doorbell rings. <laughs> yes, right? And then the potatoes are there at the beach. You, you kids poke yourselves a few times so you don't explode. Oh, mom. <laughs> if you ever had a protective mom, you know how that feels. This last one, I don't even have to read. It just is so true. Makes me nervous. Can I hear an amen from the fellow drivers? Yeah, and I think I helped teach our kids to drive. What a shame. So anyways. All right. Well, that's, uh, that's some fun for what it's worth. Let's dive into a couple of uh, drawings this weekend. And uh, the first drawing that I want to talk about uh, is helpful in lots of ways. Uh, I assume most of us, as I draw it, you'll go, yep, been there, done that, and I've decided that. Uh, and for some of you, it may be uh, a decisional illustration. And for believers, it will at least help you, as we were talking last night to some folks, uh, a lot of us struggle with how do I share my faith? And so this is a simple way to do that if you want to explain the gospel to someone uh, and help them make that decision. And so uh, I'm going to draw for as God's. I've done this before. It's not original to me, uh, but it's just so clear. All right. And so uh, if you have the app, you can follow along. But we're going to talk about, would you say, God's position? I'll tell you about that. And then we have man's condition. Say man's condition. And if you remember God's, God's, man's, man's, you can draw this or something on the back of a, of a placemat or whatever. And then say God's provision. And then finally man's decision. And it's not just mankind. Uh, it's God's position, our condition, my condition. It is God's provision in our or my decision. And this board really points to a decision every one of us must make. I assume most of us have made that. And I hope it will come very clear as to why. First of all, let's just look at what the Bible says about God's position. Uh, in Matthew 5, 48, the most famous sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You think of perfect righteousness, perfect holiness, perfect love and justice and mercy and strength and kindness and power, all of that. God is perfect. Jesus raises the bar, I'm to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. How many else, who else is in trouble besides me, okay, because I'm not there, all right? And the other verses that aren't on the, on the notes, 
In Matthew 6, verse 9, that same sermon, Jesus teaches people how to pray in the Lord's Prayer. And he starts out, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed, holy is your name. His very name is holy and, and extremely other. And in Isaiah chapter 6, go to the Old Testament, the prophet had a vision of the throne room of God and there are angelic beings and they're crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. God's position is he is perfect in his holiness. Now that creates a bit of a problem. It does for me, it does for you, if you're honest, because I am not perfect. In fact, there's an old commercial, help, I've fallen and I can't get up. Uh, our position, man's condition, uh, is he fe- started in Ephesians 2. The Apostle Paul said, You were dead in your trespasses and sins, spiritually dead, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. And so before I even knew I needed a Savior or to become a Christian, I was dead in my, in my, my spiritual, spiritual life, in my sins. And this, this verse also highlights something I've drawn in numerous ways. There is a cosmic battle going on between God and Satan, between good and evil, uh, for the souls of mankind and for your soul and your eternal destiny. Another verse is Romans 3.23. Let's read this out loud, all right, because it applies to us. Let's go. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Let's reread it and insert the word I instead of all, all right. For I have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I, without Christ, have got a problem because of God's position and my condition. The prophet Isaiah Uh, illustrates it this way. But your iniquities, your sins, have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Here, if this is God up in heaven, here is me, and my sin separates me from him. Now you might say, okay, well, big deal, we're separated. Well, Fast forward, all right, play the movie forward. Someday when you die, there's an afterlife. The overwhelming majority of Americans believe that intuitively there's more to this life than just this life. And in fact, that same majority, like 90% or so, believe there's a heaven, less believe there's a hell. When you ask them, do you suppose you're going to heaven, they will typically say yes, and you'll say why, and they'll say, because I'm a good person. Then they say, it's not like I've killed somebody, like that's the standard, all right? But if, if heaven is God's place, God's perfect, we're not. And the problem I have is if I want to get into that place as I am, my imperfection ruins that perfect place. It's like I have a glass of water here, and last night I made an erroneous statement, and both a doctor and a uh, biological something, I can't remember his title, a really smart biological guy corrected me, all right? Um, if I have that glass of water and I put a drop of E. coli bacteria in there, who could I pay to drink that water? Last night I said it would kill you. It won't kill you, but it'll make you super sick. You'll be good friends with your bathroom. All right? uh, I was told, though, that if e- Ebola, if I put a drop of that in there, that would kill you. So just one drop. Any takers? $100, $500, $1,000. We wouldn't do it. Because one, just one drop will make this what it's not. It's no longer purified drinking water. It's poison. Just one drop of it. Just one drop of of my standness trying to co-mingle with God and his perfection in heaven, I would ruin heaven. It'd no longer be that perfect place. Add all of us to that, and you can see the problem, the dilemma. And so we've got a problem because understand something, heaven is not a place for good people. Say heaven's not a place for good people. That is so important. If you think that, you're in trouble. Because when you think you're going to get there, you're not. 
Because the Bible makes it clear to us that every human being, again, from a biblical perspective, you might have a different one, but from a biblical perspective, every human being will spend eternity in the eternity, the, the place of their choosing, heaven or hell. Hell is a place of anguish and torment. And you might say, well, I didn't choose hell. Well, you, you do by default. If I'm standing on the street and on the edge of the street and a bus, RTA bus comes up and it's going downtown and I choose not to get on that bus, I do not go downtown. If you have an opportunity to accept Christ as your Savior so that you can spend eternity in heaven and you do not accept Christ as your Savior, Jesus made it clear to us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father or the Father's kingdom but by me. So you will choose that by rejection, but none of us will say when we get to heaven or hell, how did I get here? It will be intuitively, undeniably clear to us. And so our condition in itself here is hopeless unless there is a provision. And God makes a provision for us. And let me read for you a couple of verses that explain that. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God being rich in mercy. Say rich in mercy. I'm so glad he's rich in mercy. He's a God of judgment, but he's rich in mercy. Because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, in our sins, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. You are not saved. You do not go to heaven because I'm a good person. No, it is by grace. Because however fall I fall short of that perfection, it is made up for by the grace of Jesus Christ and what he did for me. I'm saved by grace. Jesus then said in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That is the incredible, mind-blowing provision of God that God would give his own Son to demote himself and, and rid himself of all the rights and privileges of heaven, be born on planet Earth in a stable, kind of like going from a palace to the sewer, and then live a life in which he was ungratified, unrespected, didn't receive what was due to him. And then he took upon himself the sins of the world, all of our sins. He was sinless, and he paid the price for our sins. That's incredible. What, what an amazing provision that is. And so we have a decision to make because the provision that God has made for us is and was paid for by his son, Jesus. So you've got a choice to make. And uh, Jesus is pretty direct about it. He was talking. We get an inside scoop on several of his conversations. John, the Gospel of John, written by Jesus' best friend, no surprise, is a very relational book. We see Jesus in relationships. And a really good man came to see him. Talk about I'm a good person. He was a Pharisee and of good intention. His motives seem pure. Pharisees were extremely uh, conscious of trying to be good and follow the rules. Not only did they follow the Ten Commandments, but they had additional laws, both spoken and written. And there were like close to 600 of these oral and written laws that they tried to meticulously obey to achieve the righteousness of God. This was a good guy. He was afraid of his peers, so he came to see Jesus at night, and he has this clandestine conversation. And in John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered Nicodemus and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, because he's only going to tell you the truth. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, you're a good guy. But your goodness will still land you in hell, because heaven is not a good place it's a perfect place. God is not a good God. He's a perfect God. And this place that is perfect cannot tolerate you in your goodness unless you are born again. You cannot get there from here. So you have a choice to make. I have a choice to make. Because another verse that I'll toss in there, uh, it's not on the screen, I believe, is Romans 6.23. If we believe all of us have sinned, how many of you are the exception to having sinned? I don't assume there'd be any hands go up. All right. All of us have sinned. 
So a few chapters later from Romans 3.23, this is all of sin. Romans 6 says, and the wages of that sin is death. The consequence of your condition is hell. But the free gift of God is eternal life. And so Joshua in the Old Testament levels the same question uh, that people have had to make throughout the centuries. Choose for yourselves today. He's talking to ancient Israelites. Whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Who are you serving? It takes me back to the early 80s when Bob Dylan came out with Slow Train Running. And one of the songs down there was, you've got to serve somebody. It may be the devil, but it may be the Lord, but you're going to serve somebody. So who are you serving? And, and the question there, you're going to serve the gods of the people in whose land you are living? And there are loads of gods of the people in the land we're living. There's the God of wealth. There's the God of stuff. There's the God of sexual pleasure. There is the God of, of popularity. There is the God of social fill-in-the-blank. There is the God of technology. And all things that go. There are so many gods to serve. Well, that's not my God. Well, if it takes number, number one place in your life, if it bumps God out of first place, it's the God you serve. Who are you serving? You must make a choice. You've got to serve the Lord. So if you want to make that choice, how do you do that? It doesn't come by a laundry list of behaviors. It starts, how do you start any relationship with someone? You've got to communicate with them. And that communication with God, you don't send them a text. You offer up a prayer. And Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says, If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. And I preached this several years ago and uh, did an unscientific social media survey. And I asked people, what are some of the things that kept you from deciding to follow Jesus when or shortly before you decided to follow Jesus? Because there's this decision that choose. You have to make a choice. So what do I choose between? What holds me back? What doesn't? And I had several interesting comments. I'll, I'll kind of review those again. In my unscientific survey, there was a trace of shame lurking in the hearts of those people that are far from God. One woman said, I had multiple reasons why I held back. I thought I had to be perfect. I couldn't do anything sinful. I was born out of wedlock and didn't feel like I was worthy enough for love. Even now I find it's a constant struggle that I still may not be worthy enough. Another person wrote, I did not believe I was worthy of salvation and God couldn't possibly love me. Now, we'll agree from the standpoint, it is hard to believe based on us that God loves us and would do that. But that hard to believe isn't true because it is true. The Bible tells us. Others said they held back because of feelings of inadequacy made them fear they couldn't keep up with the lifestyle expectations. One person said, when I was younger, I was held back by thinking it was too hard to achieve. I didn't realize the peace that was available through a relationship with God, and instead I kept focusing on trying to be perfect enough for a relationship with Him. I found it easier to distract myself and find momentary fulfillment in other things. Far too many people sort of gave the comment, I'll, I'll put words to the, to the, to the problem. It's kind of like, I felt like I should get my act together before I accepted God. That's that's like taking a shower before you take a bath. You don't clean up to get cleaned up. You know, there's an old song back in the day that was just as I am, without one plea. That's how I come to you. And as far as I know, to all of us Christians, we can kind of ease up. In fact, turn to your neighbor and say, we can relax this time. It is our responsibility to preach the truth, Yes. But last I checked, the Holy Spirit does not have, have help wanted signs out. I need you to help me condemn and convict people. It is not our role to say, and here is the list of behaviors if you want to know Jesus. No, you're talking to somebody far from God. You know what you draw for them? You don't make the whole list. You say, well, God's got a position. we got a condition. God made a provision. Oh, so wonderful. we got a decision. And there's not, And you have to do all these things. Jesus never did that. He called them to himself. And then that process begins of sanctification and becoming like Christ. 
A third group of honest people said they just plain enjoyed sin. One guy said, Billy Joel's lyric pretty well summed it up. I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints. The sinners are much more fun. The next line is, only the... Yeah, all you old folks remember that song, right? Um, one woman added, I had a fear of not fitting in and a feeling like I would never have fun again. Another simply stated, I was spiritually dead and I liked sin. Remember liking sin? Oh, come on. We still do. I'm going to ask that question again. If you're breathing and you want to pretend you're an honest person, raise your hand. How many of you remember the enjoyability of sin? That's why we do it. There is pleasure. The Bible says there's pleasure in sin. It's just short-lived and it costs you way more than you want to pay. I've quoted my mentor many times before. Sin takes you farther than you wanted to go, makes you stay longer than you wanted to stay, and makes you pay more than you wanted to pay. Can I hear an amen? But it's pleasurable. One man revealed the power of a simple come and see invitation from a friend. And when you hear this, that's why after we're done, you're going to go in the lobby and pack eggs with Easter candy and invitations to CLC because people will take that Easter. And I've met people, how'd you start coming to CLC? Somebody gave me an egg. Or somebody gave me a pie Thanksgiving, all right? But listen to the power of this invitation. He said, what it did for me was having a, a down-to-earth imperfect, non-judgmental, simple sinner like myself tell me how great CLC is and that I should come out on a Sunday. Let me reread those adjectives again that he had for his Christian friend who invited him to church. A down-to-earth, imperfect, non-judgmental, simple sinner like myself basically say, come and see. About one in five said they avoided faith in Christ because Christians they saw or knew were the main reason they didn't want to become one. They often referenced Christians who were judgmental, harsh, and unloving. The antithesis of a Savior whose admonition was to love other seekers as ourselves. And almost a fourth, 23%, were what we would call un, uh, called church unbelievers. People who tragically said they went to church but didn't know they needed to ask Jesus to be their Savior. More than one person said something like, I was raised in a church where I thought doing certain rituals was all it was about. Others said something like, I mistakenly believed that since I was a good person or since my parents were Christians that I would automatically go to heaven. Interestingly, a friend of mine for many years came up after the service and he was a church person before he came here. He said, when you drew that and explained that, it was the first time, even though I'd been in church most of my life, it was the first time I realized there is a decision I have to make. This isn't just to show up and be. It's to show up and surrender and ask and be transformed and decide. And that's when I decided to follow Christ. Finally, more than one in five people said some version of, I just didn't know I needed a Savior. Several responses were to the effect I simply had never heard the reason why I needed a Savior and how to make that happen. Well, now you have. And I would imagine there may be some of you here today. And you've gone to church and gone through all the motions. Maybe you're, you're probably a really good person. I have no doubt about that. But I have to tell you the truth. Good isn't good enough. We'll never be good enough. Not for there and him. Except through Jesus Christ, and then he says, you're more than enough. But you have a decision to make. Have you decided to follow Jesus? If not, by default, friend, you are making the choice. No, I'll face my eternity without Christ, and that is exactly what you'll do. Or, yes. What you did on the cross, I ask you to apply that same blood that you shed. I will ask you to apply that to my sins and forgive me. I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. I believe you rose from the grave. And I surrender my life to you. It's as simple as that. And the journey, the relationship begins. That's not the end. It's the beginning. So I'm going to stop right here and uh, ask you to bow your heads with me. And give us kind of two response opportunities. If you're a believer, just take this quiet moment and thank him. Thank God for loving you enough to provide for you a, a way of salvation. His name is Jesus. Just tell him thank you. 
maybe thank him for and pray a blessing over the person who introduced you to Jesus. What a place that did that. And if you don't know him, if you haven't said yes to him, I don't need to put words in your mouth. Go ahead and thank Jesus for dying on a cross for you. Tell him you're sorry for your sins. Ask him to forgive you. And then tell him you surrender your life to him and ask him to please, from this day forward, be your Lord and Savior. In this moment, just tell him that. And Lord, we're so grateful that you said yes. That you were willing to empty yourself and become a servant to serve us. Because we had a need we could not meet. And that is a need for forgiveness and grace and eternal life and hope. And we're thankful that, that through you, we now have forgiveness. We have purpose. We have joy and peace. Even in the midst of our trials, we have strength. And we have an anticipation of someday being in heaven, a perfect place for forgiven, grace-filled people where we'll spend eternity. For all those who are here at this moment, God, maybe realizing that for the first time, praying that prayer, we pray a blessing on them. We pray that they will sense that load lifted of guilt and shame, that they'll sense your peace just growing and filling in their lives. Pray they'll know the, the presence of the Holy Spirit to guide and direct them and that they'll find Christian Life Center to be a loving church home to help them become all they can be. And we thank you for the hope that we have in Christ. And we ask all of it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. For those of you who prayed that prayer, the Bible says that there is celebrating in heaven all the angels uh, or more for one person who repents than all the righteous folks. So right now in heaven, for all you who prayed, they are celebrating. Let's give an ovation to all those who prayed that prayer. Congratulations. And if you prayed that, that's the most important decision in your life. So now what? Well, if you stop by the Welcome Center, our team is there to give you some helpful information to help you along your way. Okay, how do I now follow Christ? Make that more than just a prayer, but it's a decision and it's a direction for my life. So uh, with that said, I want to go to the next drawing, and, and really they are related. Um, because did you ever ask yourself, how many of you have, have already prayed that prayer? You're a believer. Let me see your hand. Okay. Did you ever ask yourself why? Like, God, why? I mean, yeah, he loves you. And you're all kind of special. Okay. But is that it? Say no. No, it's not it. There's a why. God has a why behind this. And you've heard me say many times uh, that... that uh, why is often a futile question to ask, especially in light of life's difficulties. But, but a, a great uh, question to ask is now what? So say now what? I'm glad you asked. Because for the first time in Christian Life Center, whiteboard history. Well, actually second, I did last night. All right, For the first weekend in Christian Life Center history, we are going to thematically and physically join together two whiteboards that go together when you ask the question, now what? Say, now what? Now what? Bam! Hey. Now, you got to have some whiteboard experience to do what I just did, okay? Okay, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Let's read it out loud. This is too important not to, not to sink in. Read with me. For we are his workmanship... Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. All this happened. Jesus did all of that. And your heavenly father now says, okay, and when she comes to Christ, when he says yes, I have got these incredible things I want to do in and through their life. And I've been waiting for them to say yes. It does not end. It is not just, okay, I prayed the prayer and now I get to go to heaven, period, I'm done. No, I prayed the prayer and then Jesus tossed in this uh, little verse in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. And we call it the Great Commission. It's the last words before he went up into heaven to his followers. And he says, go. Say go. go. 
Go into all the world, make disciples. Teach them to observe all that I commanded you. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if you're on that mission, I will be with you until the end of the age. That's an incredible promise. God is with you. But the promise has a premise. Say the promise has a premise. We are really good at separating the promises from the premises. And oh, he's with me. He's with you when you're on mission for him. And when you're on mission for him, because it's part of the mission he saved you for, it's bigger than us. It's bigger than me. God's vision for you is bigger than you. Tell your neighbor it's bigger than me. Go on, just tell them. And tell them it's bigger than us. So I want to talk to you for this last drawing, and it goes a lot quicker because you've seen it a lot of times, is living that is worthwhile everywhere. Jesus in John 10, 10 said, I, I come to you and have life, have it abundantly. It's an abundant life. And sadly, we tend to monetize and materialize abundance in our culture because we have so much stuff. An abundant life goes way beyond stuff. It goes to stuff that lasts for eternity. It will be noticed and recognized in heaven. And so in Acts 1, 8, Jesus launched that life. And he told his followers, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, all Judea, and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. And Wednesday night we had our growth track. We had 35 new folks. I said, normally I draw what we call our god size vision for you, but wait, just come back this weekend. I'm going to draw it here. So here we are again. If I had a dollar for the time I drew this, I could buy us all lunch probably. But anyways, uh, you be my witnesses. Say Jerusalem. All right. And then say Judea. Say Samaria. Say uttermost part. All right, now that doesn't mean much if you don't know New Testament geography. But basically, Jerusalem's where they were. So that's where you do life. That's the street you live on. It's your township. It's where you work. It's where you shop. It's where your kids go to school. It's where your kids play sports, where you work out. I mean, all, where you do life is where you worship. That's Jerusalem. And we are to be, say, salt and light. Light is seen in the darkness and shines brightly and our culture is getting darker and darker by the day. We're to be the light and salt changes the flavor of things. Where you work, the flavor of your workplace should be different because you're there. Your neighborhood, your school, university, fill in the blank. That is what the Holy Spirit gives us the power to do. Judea, uh, the church, just a little sign for church, um, spread across Judea. So that's church multiplication for us. And we are involved through our God-sized vision in funding church planting across the Midwest and really across the nation. And uh, the offer you just gave, just as a side note, 25% of our general fund plus is uh, reinvested in ministries across our community and our nation and our world as part of our God-sized vision. And, and a couple hundred thousand typically go there. Samaria is uh, cross-cultural. Samaritans are similar but different from the Jews. And Greater Dayton, you can go from one neighborhood to the next, from one part of town to the next, and, and cultures change and shift socioeconomically, racially, I mean, in all kinds of ways. And so we have amazing partnerships across our city. And so we seek to make a difference cross-culturally uh, in our expanded uh, geographic area. Uh, when the tornado hit Dayton in 2019, we got a call from Convoy of Hope, and they said, hey, Congressman Hall wants to do something in Dayton. Can you be, would you be our partner? And we said, sure, but we're not into just putting trucks in the, in the parking lot and come get food. We want to really make a difference where it needs to be. So if we can partner with inner city churches that we work with, we have a dozen of them. If we can stock their pantries so people can go to them for food and we can lift them up in their neighborhood, we're all about that. And they said, yes, that's what we did. So we have incredible partners there. Uh, and, and we also do other things. We have uh, recovery ministries that are just incredible ministries that are working well that we're able to help and assist with. And then uh, just recently, uh, a ministry called Our House, which helps women come out of human trafficking. Uh, they appealed to us back in the fall for funding to remodel, redo a, a building on North Main Street. And so they reach out to women who are coming out of that lifestyle. We gave them $42,500 from the funds that you give. They went to the God Says Vision Fund. And we have a thank you from our house that really is to you. So we will share this video now and, and enjoy. Hello, Christian Life Center. Hello, God Size Vision Team. Hello, Pastor Stan. 
Ashley Miller with Our House Ministries here. Thank you for your partnership to get 1912 North Main Street renovated and ready for the women that we get to serve. Your generous donation made this possible, and we say thank you and God bless you. Let's thank God for what he's doing, how we can do through it. And this year, that'll be somewhere north of $2.5 million that we will reinvest in ministries uh, that go all across this. In fact, uh, we are very pro-life, not just anti-abortion, and so we've given ultrasounds to uh, crisis pregnancy centers to help them counseling women that are facing that. Uh, and just this past uh, fall, we unveiled uh, part of the God Says Vision Fund. If you are a regular attender, you're part of CLC. We now give $5,000 adoption grants to families that are seeking adoption because it's so expensive. We want to be women beneath your wings in doing that biblical approach to growing your family. So just lots of exciting things happen uh, across our, our God Says Vision. And the final one, uttermost parts, uh, we support uh, around 100 missionaries and relief organizations around the world. And uh, our deep dive, we have a, a deep dive partnership in Latin America that is growing uh, called Child Hope. And one that we have been involved in since 2007. Uh, it started, the, name, the nation was Swaziland. It's the last monarchy in Africa. And so when you are king, you can kind of do what you want, including change the name of the country. So that's what the king did a few years ago. It is now Eswatini, which I believe means people of Swaziland. But anyways, uh, this little nation on the north, on the on the border of South Africa, about the size of Rhode Island, with a million people. Three-fourths of them live in less than a dollar a day. And when we started in 07, it had one of the highest HIV rates on the continent, if not the highest. And God called us to build a church there uh, in, a, in a rural community, which we did. And then we, we built a, a house for the pastor. And uh, then we helped with a, a preschool and also sustainability. Uh, helping them be self-sustaining, and uh, we thought we were done with one until God grew that vision, and now almost 35 churches later, and counting up to, I hope up to 60, yeah. Again, when you give, uh, about $50,000 goes to uh, build these in community by community. That's how change happens. ICBC churches, uh, and we build the church, the home for the pastor. We give them a solar-powered well, and we help them plow acreage near the church and through the community because I think with a, an acre or so of ground, you can become self-sustaining for the year. So that's just some of the things that happen through the god sized vision. That's some of what God uses us to do. Say us. But us isn't effective unless us uh, consists of... Can you see that? Does that look like us? Yeah. Us is really a bunch of individual me, say me. And so it's not just enough for us to have a God-sized vision. I have to have a God-sized vision. Because God has a, a vision bigger than you for your life. God's given you gifts and abilities and talents that you may or may not be aware of. Or you might not think he could use them. And so this week, you are the only person who's going to go where you go, interact with who you interact with, do what you do, be where you are, Put all those together on that spreadsheet. You're the one person with all of that coming together in one life. And you're going to interact with people who don't know Jesus. You're going to interact with people who are in this condition far from God. You're going to come across people who maybe know God and they're in a relationship with him, but they still need help and compassion, whether it's here or across there. And so the challenge, the question, the invitation is, okay, are you thriving in God's vision for your personal life? We're probably only as strong as our weakest link, as they say. And so our prayer is that, first of all, no one walks out of here without making this decision as we did earlier. But also our prayer is that all of us are like, yeah, that's what I'm about, or I'm ready to re-up. I remember when we were in Africa years ago, uh, many of the staff have been there, and years ago Dustin Burke, our worship leader at the time, went with us. And uh, our days were really full, uh, but we had a, a couple of uh, evenings where they, they weren't, uh, after dinner, they weren't 
jammed up, and so we could just kind of, this beautiful scenery there in Eswatini, we could kind of enjoy the landscape and just reflect. And I remember Dustin wrote a song uh, back then. And uh, it really uh, became a bit of an anthem for us uh, called Lift Him High. And it's a reminder of what really matters. And you've heard me say that we've got an adversary and the devil is really good at what he does. And he is good at getting us to make sinful choices we wouldn't make otherwise. He's get good at making us make selfish choices and, and miss opportunity. But I think one of his greatest strengths is just to distract us. Just distractions. Because this board is where God says that not only do I want you, Christian Life Center, to thrive and do things beyond what you thought possible, I want each of you to thrive. I want to do things in your life beyond what you thought possible. And we get so distracted to so many things in life. And this reminder is that we are here and this all happened for us to lift Him high because if we do, He said He'll draw all people to Himself. Sing his 
For those who prayed their prayer and accepted you today, let today be a day of transformation and hope. For those of us that have, Holy Spirit, speak to us of our distractions and help us to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness and all that stuff will be taken care of. So I pray, Lord, that you would birth or rebirth or reignite a vision that you want to do in and through our lives beyond ourselves. It's God's size, greater than us, both personally and collectively. And we say yes and commit ourselves to that in Jesus' name. And everyone who agreed said amen. God bless you. Thanks so much for being here. Pack some eggs and invite somebody. Thanks for being here. Have a great week.